Welcome, thank you so much for coming here to this discussion. My name is Olesa Komarchuk, I'm the director of the Ukrainian Institute London. Um, we are a charity dedicated to strengthening Ukrainian voice in the UK and beyond. And as a charity we rely on donations, on project funding and on ticket sales. So thank you so much for purchasing your tickets to come here tonight. It makes our um, life of the Institute possible, really, so thanks a lot for that. We planned this event for the 16th of February a while ago without realizing that that date would appear in the news, in the media so much. On the one hand, you know, we heard a lot of predictions in Western media saying that this is the day of the potential attack uh, of Ukraine by the Russian troops that have encircled Ukraine in the last few months. On the other hand, a few days ago, Pre President uh, of Ukraine, um, Volodymyr Zelensky, announced that today's day is the day of national unity and flags are flying all over the country. So an interesting day, I think, to hold this discussion. Um, and we have an amazing panel of speakers with varied uh, views joining us. They should all have been here in person, but it just happened so that um, some of them, well, some of them remained in Kiev, Nolan remained in Kiev, and James actually left uh, this morning and arrived in Kiev this morning. I'm going to introduce them all now. We'll begin with the discussion among the speakers, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions from the floor as well. So think of your questions, there will be time for you to ask them. So let me just introduce a wonderful panel. I'll start with James Meek, um, who's now in Kiev. Uh, he's an award-winning writer and journalist. He reported on the former Soviet Union for The Guardian between 1991 and 1999. Uh, based, he was based initially in Ukraine and then in Moscow. Uh, he has won several awards for his reporting, including Foreign Correspondent of the Year in Britain's Press Awards. Uh, James is the author of six novels uh, and two books of short stories, as well as a collection of essays about privatization, private island, um, privatization in Britain, which won the Orwell Prize. James is contributing editor to the London Review of Books, and I'm sure you've read his pieces about Ukraine uh, recently. Uh, he's also joined in Kiev by Nolan Peterson, who is a war correspondent. Nolan has reported extensively from the front lines in Eastern Ukraine since August 2014. Uh, he's a former U.S. Air Force Special Operations pilot with combat experience in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, Nolan lives in Kyiv. He is currently senior editor for Coffee or Die magazine. Uh, and Nolan is also the author of a memoir, Why Soldiers Miss War, published in 2019. And here in London, I'm joined by Paul Mason, a journalist, writer, and filmmaker. Um, as, e as economics editor at both BBC Newsnight between 2001 and 2013 and Channel 4 News between 2013 and 2016, he covered the global financial crisis, the Arab Spring, the Gaza War and the Greek crisis. Uh, Paul writes weekly columns for the New Statesman and the New European. He is a frequent guest, as I'm sure many of you know, on TV and radio shows. He's the author of seven books, including How to Stop Fascism, History, Ideology, Resistance, which came out last year. And we're also joined by Anna Reid, uh, a journalist and historian. She worked as key correspondent for The Economist and The Daily Telegraph between 1993 and 1995, and later covered the country for The Economist Intelligence Unit. From 2002 until 2006, she ran foreign affairs program for the think tank Policy Exchange. Exchange. She is the author of several books, including Hello, I lost the sound. Uh, one, two. Oh, and it's back. See this mic? It's just it just doesn't like me. Never mind. Uh, so she, yes, she's the author of lots of books, including the one that might be familiar to many of you here, Borderland, Journey Through the History of Ukraine. And Anna has been the trustee of the Ukrainian Institute of London since 2016. Um, and she has just returned from Kiev, so she was there last week, Anna, is that right? Last week. Yeah, so we have a really impressive panel of speakers, all holding rather different views, but very well-informed views on Ukraine. Um, just before I ask the first question, I just wanted, I just felt like it's important to reiterate that in spite of the coverage we heard in the media, the war is not about to start. That's not what we, that's not the situation we're looking at. The war began, of course, in 2014 with the legal annexation of Crimea and then Russia's aggression in Donbass. 
And since then, um, Ukrainians have lost 14,000 lives, um, a million and a half people are internally displaced, Ukraine has suffered uh, economically significantly, um, not to mention the societal trauma that you know, the entire nation is, nation is going through since 2014. But at the same time, most of things have changed. The Ukrainian army now is not the same it was in 2014. It is uh, much better equipped, much better trained. Um, and the people, of course, while they are hoping for de-escalation and a lasting de-escalation and not just temporary, they are also preparing for all sorts of scenarios. I'm sure you've all heard that many people are going to first aid courses, some are joining um, local territorial defense units, um, and uh, you know, preparing for a variety of scenarios um, in order to make sure that their loved ones are safe. Um, and over the last few months, the world has been trying to um, read Russian president's mind, trying to predict where this escalation might take us, where it might go. I would like to urge us all to resist that temptation tonight, at least for a while, and maybe focus on the things we do know. Um, and that's really in, in, the, in the title of this, of this event. Um, yes, potential escalation in Ukraine, what's at stake for the West? Um, in 2014, the West responded very differently. It, was, um, it could be summarized with the infamous phrase now, deep concern, um, and some action, but not very much. We see a very different response now of democratic leaders. Uh, there's a lot more unity, there's uh, financial and military aid being sent to Ukraine, um, heads of state visit Kyiv, and um, they make strong declarations. At the same time, we also see uh, embassies reducing their staff, some embassies leaving uh, and evacuating, um, moving to Lviv, to Western Ukraine, and urging their citizens to leave Ukraine. So, kind of mixed messages, maybe. And this is my first question to all of our speakers, really. How do you assess the response of the West? Um, Paul, maybe you could also comment on the, you know, it's not that we, we see a lot of united voices uh, in the UK and the government, but, it, but, but not everybody. Here we go. Not everybody is united. The left is not united. We hear different positions on the left. There's a lot of criticism of the Conservative Party and especially them failing um, to deal with the wealth uh, of Russian oligarchs in London. So we hear that those discussions over the last few days in particular. Um, so yeah, give us the assessment maybe of the, of the response that you saw from the West and any other remarks that you might uh, have. Maybe we could begin with people in Kyiv. How about that? Yeah, shall we? Yes. Uh, James, would you like to start? Sure. Um, I, uh, there are different ways or as, as an individual uh, of sensing what uh, the West thinks. I mean, we talk a lot about what Russia thinks, what Ukraine thinks, but it's also how do we work out what the mood is. Um, there are, uh, there's the mainstream media, there's also social media, and there's just the kind of conversations that you have or the things that you hear people saying. And I do feel that there's been this um, troubling and consistent trend um, in, in the discourse, often on the left, um, sometimes on, on the extreme right as well, but um, from um, people like, like the progressives um, uh, in, in, in senior positions in the United States, that this inability to distinguish between uh, a discussion of all the problems that Ukraine has and perhaps discussion in a sort of abstract way um, of the relationship between Russia and Ukraine and their respective histories and what is actually happening now. Uh, and I mean, it's, um, it's an emotive comparison, but I, I think the, uh, the language of, of abuse um, and stalking um, is, is appropriate in this context. If, if, if you are in the street and you see some guy with a knife charging up to a woman and grabbing her and saying, come back home now and fuck me or I'll kill you, then your first question is not, now, did those two not used to be married? That, that's not the, uh, the main thing. You, you call the police. Unfortunately, in this, in this case, the police are not available. But um, th there's got to be a distinction between the, the very, very specific uh, situation of, of threat 
that Ukraine faces now and other discussions. So when people say to me, oh, yes, but, you know, there used to be one country, um, I say, you can talk about that another time. This is, this is a different situation. I think that on the whole, uh, the speaking very, very broadly, the, uh, the actions of, um, of the leaders in, um, in America, uh, and, and even, I hate to say it, in Britain, um, has, been, has been well judged, um, except in one quite important respect. Um, they have reacted very much to Putin's NATO uh, ideas. Uh, we don't want Ukraine to join NATO. We insist that NATO should be excluded from, uh, from the, the areas of, of, uh, of Europe uh, where countries were granted membership in 1997 and so, and so forth. Um, and I feel that there's a very important counter pressure. It may not seem that it, it matters because it's simply words, it's simply rhetorical. Um, and, and I guess some people might feel, well, this is not very diplomatic when you were trying to calm Putin down. But I feel that there should be at all times uh, a pressure on Putin to make it absolutely clear whether he does or does not recognize Ukraine as a country. Because going back to 2014, I feel this was the, the real problem for Ukraine. I mean, please disagree with me. Uh, the people didn't understand that um, they had to fight at every stage because they had no idea because Putin wouldn't say what he wanted. They did not know when he would stop. So you have to keep fighting um, in Donbass, even if um, in many ways uh, it might be better for Ukraine to be, uh, to be without Donbass. Controversial thing to say. Um, you have to keep fighting because you don't know when they will, when they will stop. Uh, and until uh, Putin can be uh, persuaded to, to make it clear, we had his advisor, um, his old Ukraine advisor, Surkov, saying in, a, in an interview with the Financial Times a few months ago, um, I think there might be a country in Ukraine, but I'm not sure. I think he said, I haven't decided where the border is yet. Um, now, that is unacceptable. If you're talking about negotiations, if you're going to who, the people who are supposedly your negotiating partners and saying, we want to redraw the security map of Europe, then one of the starting points has to be your acceptance of the, the borders. Uh, so I don't feel enough pressure has been put on Russia from that point of view, and that it simply hasn't been raised enough. Um, there's a very, and this is my, my final point, um, I think there's a very important uh, process that's been going on in Ukraine since 2014, and in fact, you could say much earlier since the Orange Revolution, um, that has lessons for places like Britain and, and America. Um, unlike countries, other countries where there were unsuccessful revolutions, you had, and you still to some extent do have this alliance between groups in society which don't really have a huge amount in common. Uh, in Ukraine's case, the nationalists, um, the sort of the more romantic nationalists, the more um, rural nationalists, perhaps, um, especially in the West, on the one hand, and the intellectuals, the liberals, um, the people for whom membership of the European Union is, is tremendously important. Um, you have this, this, this strange alliance between, between liberals and nationalists, um, and that's an alliance. Um, another way of putting it would be between, let's say, liberals and, and traditionalists. Um, that's an alliance that other countries, whether they're in revolution um, or um, simply uh, for the time being in a state of political crisis like the United States, an alliance that... Um, other countries haven't yet been able to, to build. Uh, and I think the way that you saw in 2014, 2015, um, much as they might mistrust and not really understand each other, the way you had these, um, these intellectuals and liberals and, and, and middle-class volunteers um, working together with um, the, um, the guys from the, from the small villages standing alongside them in the trenches, 
um, delivering supplies to them. Uh, that is, I think that's unusual and interesting in our time. Uh, and uh, and that the, we have, have, have much to learn from that. And perhaps Ukraine needs to be more self-conscious of that um, and, and think about it and talk about it. And um, there was a very, an excellent book um, by uh, the Ukrainian writer Artyom Tiech, um, about his time in the, in the trenches. And he talked about this very explicitly. Here I am, this, this liberal who, um, for whom bike paths and, and blueberry smoothies are terribly important, um, fighting alongside in the trenches um, with people who believe in, in absolutes, uh, in right and wrong, who believe in God, um, who believe in tradition, who are extremely socially conservative. And yet, there we are finding, finding common cause. Thank you. Ooh, apologies. Thank you so much, uh, James, for those points. Um, Artem Cech's book, by the way, is called Absolute Zero. It's translated into English if you want to read it. It's wonderful. And it's a diary of a, of a soldier from, from, from uh, the early years of the war. Um, and thanks so much for bringing up the unity question as well. I think today's date of being proclaimed as a national day of unity is not accidental, obviously. This is to highlight that Ukrainians have been united throughout this war and are now united more than ever. And that's really um, in stark contrast to the narratives that we hear from the Kremlin about the divided nation, which I think the media is actually in the West picked up and now has to understand that I made a mistake by describing Ukraine as a divided nation. It is not. And we, can, we can see a clear, clear uh, picture of that now. Um, right. Um, Nolan, can I ask you to, to uh, make your comments, please? Uh, so, you know, since 2014, I've reported on this conflict. And over the past eight years on the front lines, I've seen artillery barrages, tank combat, gunfights, trench warfare, you know, a civilian airliner shot from the sky. I mean, the combat I've seen here has exceeded in intensity anything I ever saw in Iraq and Afghanistan as a special operations pilot and as a journalist covering those wars. Now, I remember in the summer of 2014 in Mariupol, watching tanks shoot at, shoot at each other. You know, tank combat in a European country in our time. And the most distinct impression I had then, especially when I got back to my hotel room that night and was checking social media was, why does this feel like a secret? A major conventional war in Europe, and it felt like nobody was talking about it. And granted at the time, you know, that was the year that ISIS was running around, you know, taking over half the Middle East. There was a war in Israel and it was a very crowded news environment. But the war in Ukraine did not get the attention it deserved at that time. And over the past eight years, the war has faded from the headlines. Now that's changed. And there's been an inundation of foreign journalists and diplomats here in Kiev now that the war has gotten to this critical moment. But as somebody who's been here for the last eight years, I have to say, like, why did we wait now until now? at the precipice of this horrible catastrophe to finally pay attention to an ongoing land war in Europe that's killed more than 14,000 people. I mean, for, more, for almost a decade, for eight years, two of Europe's largest land armies have been shooting at each other in the Donbass. And what did we think was going to happen? There was always a chance that this war could escalate and spiral out of control to something much bigger and far deadlier. I think it's important to note that the war in Ukraine, the ongoing war in the Eastern Donbass region is not a civil war. It's always been a Russian invasion of a sovereign country. And the fact is that this war is about to escalate now into a much bigger disaster. About 14,000 people have died over the past eight years in the Donbass. That many people could die in a matter of days considering the type of war we're looking at. Let's be honest, Russia now, right now, has the firepower poised on Ukraine's borders to execute the worst case scenario, which is a multiple direction invasion of the entire country, a possible encirclement of Kyiv, an air campaign that we probably haven't seen since Desert Storm that could kill the lion's share of Ukraine's military in a few days. And this is extraordinarily serious. And you know, I, I think that the, the Western attention has been certainly helpful at this la at this at this moment in this sort of last dish diplomatic push may bear fruit. It may have sort of diverted Moscow from the brink here at the last minute, 
Um, but, you know, amid the reports of a possible Russian drawdown, we're hearing reports today that actually Russia is adding more troops to Ukraine's borders. So it looks like they're, you know, this, that we're not out of the woods yet and that things could potentially uh, still get worse. And I have to say that, you know, the, the weapons deliveries lately have certainly sent a very strong message of solidarity to Ukraine's civilians and soldiers. And it, you know, it reminds them that the West has remembered their cause effectively and, they're, and that they're not alone. But for, I think from a military perspective, I have to say it's probably too late for those weapons to make a measurable difference on the battlefield. I mean, the kind of war we're looking at now, like I said, is probably something uh, resembling Desert Storm. And I think Ukraine's air defenses are very inadequate to defend against the Russian threat. And it would take years for Western aid to measurably improve Ukraine's ability to defend against that kind of attack. Uh, this spirit of resistance from Ukraine's civilian population is extraordinarily high. My 57-year-old father-in-law, my 59-year-old uncle-in-law, both Soviet Army veterans, have volunteered to serve in territorial defense forces. And I have no doubt that if the Ukrainian military is defeated in the field of battle, that the Ukrainian nation will step up and fight for their freedom and wage an insurgency. But again, you know, insurgencies don't happen overnight with the flick of a switch. It's going to take time for that to happen. When I was in the U.S. military, we had a, uh, a saying, the pottery barn rule, right? Right, which is... You break it, you own it. And so we stuck around after we broke Afghanistan and Iraq, and we tried to rebuild those countries to shape them in the way we wanted. I fear that if Russia attacks Ukraine, they may simply break it and walk away. And this notion that Russia is going to somehow stick around and rebuild Kiev or rebuild the destruction or try to occupy the country, that's basing it on an American model that I do not think Russia will emulate. They could just you know, wage a war to basically set Ukraine back a generation in its political, economic, cultural, and military development. So anyway, I sort of have a very pessimistic view of where we're at. I think the evidence points to Russia's readiness to conduct a major military operation on short notice. I would be pessimistic uh, based on these recent uh, announcements from the Kremlin that they're pulling the soldiers back. The evidence doesn't back it up uh, quite yet. Um, and I think in a final point, you know, the illusion of, you know, putting a gun to somebody's head in the sidewalk and threatening them is an apt one. You know, when, if you do that, if you threaten somebody with violence, you've already committed the crime, whether you pulled the trigger or not. And so I think for the life of me, these past few months, as I've seen these, this threat mount to Ukraine, I continually question, like, why are we waiting until Russia attacks to do something? Let's cancel Nord Stream 2 now. Let's add more sanctions on Russia now. Let's do something now to prevent this before 50,000 civilians, according to U.S. estimates, are killed or wounded in this attack. What in God's name are we waiting for? Russia has already committed the crime and is well past time for us to punish them that in 2022, we should not allow countries to threaten the lives of civilians and other sovereign states to get their way. And I, you know, Ukraine does not pose an existential or any threat to Russia's national security. And let's be clear, this is not about NATO. Uh, you know, I've spent eight years on the front lines here and I can tell you, Ukrainian soldiers are not fighting to join NATO. They're fighting to remain a sovereign, democratic country free from Russian oppression. And any Russian propaganda to say otherwise is a lie. NATO is, this the whole NATO thing is a complete false flag diversion from reality to try and get the West to think this is somehow our fault. But this all boils down to Russia, Russia wanting to re-divert Ukraine's pro-Western trajectory and to re-establish Russia's overlordship of this country. And if, if you interpret this conflict in any other way, I, I personally believe you're completely off base because this does not have to do with NATO. This has to do with Ukraine's sovereign right to exist as a free democratic country and Russia trying to reverse the course of history and reestablish control over this country. Thank you. Thank you so much. Just to say the question of NATO, I'm sure it will probably pop up in the discussion again, but there was very marginal support for NATO in Ukraine before 2014. It's only after Russia attacked the North Donbass and after uh, Russia annexed Crimea that the support started to rise. So it's a, it's a, it's an old question, really. It's a completely made up situation, made up question. Yeah, I mean, Ukrainians, you know, everyday people, men and women, you know, from teenagers to people in their seventies, took to the Maidan and brave sniper fire, and they weren't doing that to join NATO, right? They wanted. I mean, my wife, 20, 26 year old Ukrainian woman. She went out on the Maidan and protested because she wanted to be part of the West. 
She wanted perhaps, to flee. Perhaps that is the most threatening thing for the Kremlin to see the country that wants to reform, that wants to look west uh, and, and so on. You know, so if right. Ukraine doesn't pose any threat to the Kremlin, that is the threat. <laughs> it's to yes, see it is. a yeah. developing economy like, on, the, on, on this doorstep for sure. It's, Thank you it's, for your support. It's to turn away. Ukrainians want to turn away from Russia, to turn their backs to Russia, not to join NATO to threaten Russia. And so I think that needs to be made very clear because Russia is trying to distort that reality. And this is all about Ukraine having the sovereign right to choose their own future. It has nothing to do with NATO expanding or any of that stuff. It's all a lie. <laughs> and I think that we need to do a better job as journalists to hold Russia accountable for that mistruth and not somehow lay blame in our own, our own societies for this. Because this is a choice, a choice by the Kremlin elite, probably a choice by one man to do this. And it's a crime. Let's be honest, this is a crime, what may happen here in the coming weeks. Thank you so, thank you so much, Nolan. I'll pass, because Michael probably like you better than me, um, to Paul now. Well, thank you. Um, so the, the question asked uh, in the title of the meeting is what's at stake from, from this conflict uh, for the West? I think we should start by defining the West. And unfortunately, that's really quite easy to do. Mm. On February the 4th, um, Xi Jinping and Vladimir Putin issued a joint statement of their design for the world. And it is a statement that says the concept of a rules-based international order is dead. Uh, the concept uh, which you thought was founded in 1945 um, by the UN with the U Universal Declaration of Human Rights in Poly 8 uh, through the European Convention on Human Rights, all the international architecture that you thought was a rules-based system in which there were certain universal standards where one country just could say to another, hold on a minute, we don't think you're observing these standards. And indeed, civil society, I can pick up the phone and say to my friends in Turkey, I'm going to support you in taking Turkey to the but whatever, UN, the, the European uh, Court of Human Rights. That is dead, say Putin and Xi Jinping, as of February before 2022. And what will replace it is an order in which they too, which have similar but different systems, have decreed that there will be what they call multiple modernities. And in the multiple modernities, the, the universality of human rights is gone. It still exists as a declaration, but now it's for national governments. In explicit contradiction to the actual declaration itself, by the way, for national governments to interpret what that universalism means. That's the first problem. Second, it's for national cultures, like the Communist Party of China and United Russia in, in Russia, to decide what modernity means. And therefore, when they say multiple modernities, they mean, really, let's get this honestly, multiple truths. If, if, you know, if Xi Jinping says that everyone in uh, camps in Xinjiang are happy, and then if his acolyte Vijay Prashad in India of the Tri-Continental Institute stands up and says the same thing, then it must be true. Um, and if Putin says Ukraine doesn't exist, and that uh, Krasovsky says and Ukrainians are not even a people, then that's a truth. And we have to accept that there's no universality to truth. That's the world we know in. And that's why it's really easy to define who is the West. The West is everybody who doesn't accept that. The West is everybody who wants to stick to what we thought we'd achieved in 1945 to 1948 or 8, which is a world system. And which actually could tolerate for a long time, because this is no surprise, it's tolerated for a long time. A Chinese Communist Party, for whom, you know, a government from which there has never been any minutes issued, no record of its decisions, no record of vast swathes of injustices. We tolerated it for a long time within that system, but they've decided it's over. So what, what's at stake for the West in this conflict is how the West is going to react to the first proof of concept by Xi Jinping and Putin for a world without rules. Incidentally, it, contacts I have within Ukraine, inside you know, the, the, the government, believe and have believed operationally in this crisis that this is a joint enterprise. 
that it wasn't sort of that that was not an accident that Putin and Xi did this um, on the eve of the Olympics, into which, far from stepping back during the Olympics, their plan always was to use the Olympics to prove that this is a job. Well, what is at stake is what we do about it. Um, leads me to 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 to, to say the following. Um, we, the key, you know, the, the major powers of the West, um, Britain, France, you know, America, the three P5 countries, the major economic powers, Germany, um, we're at a decision point, uh, and our populations and our civil societies are at a decision point. As a member of the left, you may know, you know that the left is heavily divided over the Ukraine question in Britain. Um, but what I've observed is, we're not now just facing people prepared to say Russian talking points like NATO is trying to encircle Russia, which is rubbish, you look at a map. Uh, we are now hearing figures like, for example, Richard Sapper, uh, the, the, the Russian specialist at the University of Kent, intellectually make the case for the Putin Xi vision of the world as a better thing. Not just a better thing for Russians and Chinese people, but a better thing for Western people. And what the, who else supports that? I'm afraid the whole far-right, populist right of the United States supports that vision. So what's at stake is whether or not we, those of us who support the idea of a rules-based order, albeit, as in my case, a heavily critical left, uh, you know, wing critical critic of it, um, what do we do? What, what is our response? Now, I think my response would be that we have to, put, yet when you ask what's Putin trying to achieve, it's, it, I mean, those I speak to in the security and, 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 and defense world understand very well that you can't ask what's his objective. Because it's like asking in the, game, the Japanese game of Go, what is the objective? It's not like a chess match where the objective is to take the king or checkmate. It's, it's, a, it's a fluid, self-defined game, that, defined by the players. And Putin plays Go, that's how he sees the world. Um, so the objective, simply put, is to disorganize the West, to, to disorganize NATO, to disorganize the European Union, to sideline the European Union from the game, so that the game is simply played between Putin and whoever happens to be the US president. And I'm sorry to our US colleagues here to say this. And in that game, once every four years, Putin attempts to decide who the US president is. That's how tough the situation is. The only thing we can do, because we think we are on the back foot. A lot of neocons in the West have said, why have we let ourselves be, be put on the back foot? Why aren't we inside Putin's decision cycle? Why is he inside our decision cycle? That is the current shape of the game. He is inside our decision cycle. And what we have to do is to react and respond in a way that minimizes the sidelining of the European Union, minimizes the divisions within NATO, and minimizes the ability of both Putin and Xi Jinping to sow existential divisions inside Western society. And I think we can, what I am trying to do in the work and the contribution and whatever I do, the writing and when I go to Ukraine later this week, is, is, to, is to say, well, the Ukraine crisis is an, is an opportunity to do that. To, to, to put lines in the sand, to put markers down for how we want to maintain the unity of the European Union, give NATO a new strategic concept which can, which can be bought into by all its populations and all the people you know, in it and all its allies like, like the Nordic countries, and to reiterate that there is international law and that if, as, the, as Nolan says, I, think, I also think the worst case scenario, I've only reported one war, Gaza, you know, 3,000 killed at the time I was there. This will be much, much worse. But at the end of it, and there will be an end, there will be, it, there will be a case to present against the perpetrators under international law if it happens. And we should be preparing the case to put Putin on trial. i say one final thing. Unlike the governments of the West, a lot of what I've said could be said by Western liberals. Okay? Um, but as a leftist, I would add one thing. We have no self-denying ordinance over revolution in Putin's Russia and Xi Jinping's China. 
I've been to China six times. I've talked talk to oppositionists there, to the independent workers movement. It's not true that it's a monolith. It's also not true. When the last time I was in Russia, deep in the, in the east of Russia, speaking to uh, young audiences who came to speak to me, were desperate to get me rid of the system that they've been uh, in, that's been imposed on them. It might be true that Western governments sort of want to stabilise things, but I just don't think either Putin's Russia or Xi Jinping's China are stable, and they'll not be stabilised over the long term, and there will come a day, and if anyone is watching this in China or on a VPN in Russia, there will come a day when both those regimes fall. And as a leftist, I've got no problem in saying speed that day. We've covered so much ground already that um, I'll keep my remarks short. Um, first of all, what the, the West's reaction, it's a massive improvement on 2014, obviously. Um, just the level of, um, you know, basic knowledge of, of, of Ukraine um, and its relationship with Russia and its history is much better now than it was, and you can see that in the reporting. Um, UK, the UK is not at the centre of this crisis. You know, we're not part of the Normandy format. For you know, Johnson has not been um, part of of this. You know, he hasn't he hasn't been to Moscow. He hasn't taken a leading role in the same same way that Macron Scholz have done. Um, the US's approach, I think, of calling out Russia right from the beginning has been extremely effective. I know it's controversial within Ukraine, and Zelensky made some um, difficulties for Zelensky, and he said cool it at various points. But I think that the US determination not to be caught by surprise in the same way that it was with Crimea and Donetsk and Luhansk um, has really paid off. And that the way they've you know, put all the intelligence out there on the table, including some you know, quite superficially absurd sounding scenarios has really worked. It's stripped away that um, sort of, you know, postmodern theatrical um, sort of gloss that Putin was able to give his aggression back in 2014 and I think sort of kept the discussion real and the threat real and in front of people's eyes. Um, the, 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 the sort of element this crisis has, which I don't think we've seen before, is it's, it's deeply psychological, I think. And as um, James said earlier, you know, the, the very obvious parallel is, 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 a, is a man, you know, a former boyfriend who can't bear to see his, his ex go off with somebody else and will prefer to throw acid in her face, um, you know, to, than to see her happy elsewhere. Uh, the, the sort of psychological aspect of this, I think, was very well illustrated in the essay you might have read that was put out by the Kremlin under Putin's signature back in July, called On the Historical Unity of Russians and Ukrainians. And it's slapped an extremely slanted, but nonetheless more or less factual, um, version of history from sort of Vladimir onwards until you got to Stalin, whose name is not mentioned once <laughs> in this whole 7,000 words, um, nor is the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact. He, he phrases it as, um, Russia regained lands previously seized by Poland. <laughs> um, and when we get to closer to present day, it descends into total post-truth propaganda and becomes very emotional. Having been quite sort of calm, reasonable language up to that point, it suddenly becomes heated and passionate. And that you know, the, the, the sense of that deep sense of Russian ownership of, U, of Ukraine, that feeling, as, as James again put it, that Ukraine shouldn't really exist. It doesn't, it shouldn't be an independent country. It's just not right. You know, Ukraine is part of us. That sense of ownership is real. Um, and honestly, completely unjustified and not something we should pander to, but it is real. And um, as I'm sure we all know from Russian friends and acquaintances, even the best Putin-hating liberals, you know, they still have a difficulty often accepting that Ukraine really is a separate country which wants to go its own way, and it's a real place. 
Now, this is even people who haven't been to Ukraine in years upon years, and it's a sort of ancestral memory. It's not based on actual experience or fact at all, but it's there. And that is something the West needs to take into account, not in order to pander to it, but in order to, when you're trying to guess what the Kremlin's moves are likely to be, you have to take into account that psych psychological background. Um, on on, on the, the West's accent so far, um, Germany's obviously been the back market, seems to be have come into line in recent days. Um, you know, Schultz has got that, you know, his party's tradition of Ostpolitik, which it seems he's putting behind him. There's the problem of uh, dependence on Russian gas, of course, which is going to be very expensive if they don't open Nord Stream or stop buying Russian gas. Um, wonderful that we're sending arms to Ukraine. It, it may be token, but it presumably will change the calculus a little bit for Putin, you know, when he's doing his totting up of the likely body bags. Um, the real crunch point well, is sanctions. You know, what kind of packages of sanctions will we really put together? How much pain are we prepared to take? I fear that here we're going to be disappointed. Um, I talk to friends who have got nothing in particular to do with Ukraine or Russia. I say, how much do you think the British public really does care about Ukraine? And I'm afraid the answers I get are zilch, square root of nothing, that kind of language, straight away, just like that. Um, I don't know if a Labour government is going to be better on the anti-money laundering um, than, than the Conservative ones so far. I'd be interested to hear Paul's views on that. On, on James's point about the alliance there is in Ukraine between urban liberals, often you know, primarily Russian-speaking, and traditional um, uh, rural Westerners. Um, that, that, that's amazing and, it, and it's wonderful, but there is a group that is left out of that often, and that is working class, primarily Russian speakers. Now, I know it's, I know it's a great canard about Ukraine to say that, uh, say that political uh, allegiance follows language. It doesn't. Um, but nonetheless, uh, to, 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 you know, the, the, the journalist's most cliché possible thing, but talking to a taxi driver in Kiev the other day, you know, he, he was a Russian speaker, and I asked him what he think about the Krees, and he started talking about it and he said, you know, isn't it awful, we hope nothing's going to happen, but almost immediately he launched into a long diatribe about, a long heartfelt complaint about how his living costs are simply uncopable with, you know, he can't pay his bills, he can't pay his rent, he can't pay his bills, he's old, that's what his elderly parents, he's got his children. Um, and that is what really matters to people. Um, and he, he viewed the entire political class with total cynicism, he hated them all. You say, I, it, he actually wanted to have a Kovic back, I said, but oh, you must have come in to see Medjugorje, you know, you know that, you know, that grotesquely expensive and hideous compound of his. Um, and he said, they're all the same, they're all the same, they've all got these, these palaces. Um, so there is deep cynicism there, and one thing the West must not forget to do um, in the midst of the current dramas is to carry on pushing Kiev to carry out internal reforms. Because loyalty to one's government does have to be earned. You know, the moment people can put us, they, they can be patriotic and still despise their government, but, you know, that, but, but despise all your governments always, and that is that's weakening, that has a very undermining effect, and we have to keep pushing on Kiev to stop the corruption. I mean, that, that, that is such a, a, a hideous sort of continuous internal weakness. Um, but of course and it's something which might, good that might come out of this. But of course the civil society in Ukraine that pushes uh, for reforms as well, we don't need the West only to, to push Kiev, although they might listen to the West better than to their own people, but uh, uh, it's still the electorate, you know, unlike in Russia we have had two free elections, uh, and, you know, that were electing very different people, so they probably do want to make sure that they listen to the electorate, at least on those taxi drivers, to at least a little bit, and the society does want to get rid of corruption. So, so that's really important. Thank you, Anna. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but you, you touched on something. No, you're quite right. It's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's, it's such a horrible point. We don't even want to have to think about it, you know, but it's, but it's real and it's there and it's, you know, it, it is an ongoing problem. Of course.
course, absolutely. You touched on something that I really want to um, ask all of our speakers before we open the floor for a discussion, um, and that's the, the sort of the psychological aspect of this war. It's a hybrid war. We know that. Um, we we've seen a lot of cyber attacks just over the last few weeks. There was one last uh, yesterday, uh, specifically attacking um, state-owned banks and other websites, government websites. There are constant bomb threats. I talk to my friends who have to pick up their children from school almost every day in every part of Ukraine. It's absolutely demoralizing having to pick up your five, six-year-old standing outside uh, because there's a bomb threat in the school. Um, and, and other places as well receive these bomb threats, so large uh, you know, supermarkets, that kind of stuff. Um, but most of these are so, so far targeting Ukrainians inside the country. There is, however, an aspect of this um, hybrid war that is targeting us here uh, and all over the world, and that's disinformation. So you're all journalists, you're all authors. Here's my question to you. How do we, I mean, I'm tempted to say how do we fight it, but also before we fight it, how do we make people aware that they are often consuming narratives that are pushed from the Kremlin, um, in which the Kremlin invests a lot of money, so all of these that Nolan mentioned earlier, the divided country, the civil war, and so on, I've seen all of these repeated in mainstream media, um, over the last eight years, how do we educate people not to consume this information, but also how do we minimize it? I mean, this is RT, but we, Paul and I met for the first time in London outside of RT office in London during the protest. There's a state-funded, uh, Russian state-funded, um, you know, um, broadcaster that is broadcasting in London. Who would like to go first? Paul, yes? Well, um, let's be clear, disinformation is just one aspect of hybrid warfare. But I, I find myself constantly having to explain to educated British people what hybrid warfare is, and that, that a major country has this as a doctrine which it is applying to us in our democracy. Leave aside the poor people in Ukraine who are dealing with what you've just said. Um, it's not propaganda, it's a mixture of disinformation, organized crime, corruption, lobbying, di ordinary diplomacy, military threats, assassinations, whose aim is to, to disorganize the resilience of the quote-unquote, in Gerasimov's famous uh, formulation, the victim state. Um, that is what is being practiced against Western democracies. As a socialist, I'm critical of many aspects of Western democracy. I'm critical of Guantanamo. I'm critical of Hungary's idiotic um, president. Yeah, but but that is what is that is what is happening. Now, in that context, I think it changes what it is to be a journalist, and it also changes what it is to be a member of civil society involved in political life. Um, to, to, to give examples, I attended a Stop the War online rally with many of my friends uh, on the left of the Labour Party uh, last week, and one particular MP, Diane Abbott, stood up and said, uh, quite you know, in, in a kind of almost pre-prepared script, that this crisis has been caused by the aggression, aggressive expansion of NATO, and that NATO was advancing troops to Russia's border is part of the encirclement thing. And honestly, I, I took uh, away you know, friends who were like, thought, yeah, maybe that's pushing it a bit. But you know, NATO has been expanded, hasn't it? Yeah. Yes, of course, in the 90s, um, aggressively, or maybe unwisely. There's a whole George Kennan you know, view of this, that it was un maybe unwisely. But look at the borders. You know, it, the only place, the only Russian part of Russian territory that is in circle is Kaliningrad, which is a sort of, you know, an area denial, uh, anti-access weapon uh, sort of zoo. I, it is, it is, in its own little way, encircled the whole of the Baltic states. So, what do we do when we're faced with that? So many people in society want to avoid it because it means having an argument, it's like COVID, it means having an argument with your mad auntie about wearing a mask or vaccination. And you're laughing now, but so many of us have been involved in those mad, mad anti-arguments. We also have to be involved with in sort of, sort of mad liberal or leftist or right-wing conservative friend who wants to believe this stuff. And here's the point about specifically disinformation. 
disinfo is not propaganda. Di the best disinfo is when you don't know it's disinformation. When it comes from your friend, when it comes from your mad auntie, when it comes from a, 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 a comrade and an MP who's been brilliant on all other issues but has bought this ridiculous Kremlin talking point. That's what disinfo is. And I've said this openly as a member of the Labour Party to my friends and colleagues. We, and I wish the Conservative Party would be as open, we are in a, a theatre of war for Vladimir Putin. Every time somebody stands up and says, but Soviet Union was a brilliant, they won the war, and then in the next minute say, and the Ukraine doesn't even exist, or writes a book, as Andrew Murray did, Corbett's former advisor, basically arguing what Putin argues in that essay, that the historical uh, relationship of, of Ukraine and Russia is an accident, and though the internal borders of the Soviet Union were accidental and non-significant, um, which is a, in itself an, an echo of what Putin says, they were foisted on Great Russia by Vladimir Lenin. I mean, you just have to know where these arguments come from, and then take everything back to the concrete. That's what I do with my friends, concrete. Come and look at a map. Come and look at the casualty figures of the last eight years. And, and I'm sure the other speakers have got more to say about that. Thank you. James, would you like to go next? It's such a it's such a vast subject and it, it uh, spins out from the situation with Ukraine and, and, and overlaps with um, with the COVID uh, disinformation uh, operations by, by various individuals. It, it overlaps with um, with Stop the Steal campaign in the United States. I mean, all these things kind of seem to seem to join together and and all are are motivated by by similar situations, by, by people's love of, of, of rumor and, and, and gossip and stories and having the inside information. I mean, I used to think that people did not like to be lied to, but now I've realized they do like to be lied to if they like the lie. And uh, that, that is the fundamental problem. Uh, and all we can do is, um, is, is do our jobs as well as we can. Um, try not to, I mean, there is this very, very strong tendency to spread disinformation by saying, look at this ridiculous thing that somebody has said. Um, when, I was, when I was younger, I, I didn't really know what the Daily Mail was saying. Um, was that a bad thing that I didn't know what was in the Daily Mail, the Daily Telegraph? I didn't really like them. Uh, I, I didn't think that they were very good newspapers, although they had some very good journalists. Um, I just didn't read them. They weren't there. But now, um, with social media, um, people are... The, the great thing about social media, it, it is brilliant about telling you um, the worst possible things that the people you hate the most are saying. And it ratchets up that anxiety, that, that stress, that, that pressure. Um, and I think part of this, um, and I know this, this sounds like a terribly lame um, and bleak answer, is uh, that we are still working through our habits with, uh, with the internet. Uh, maybe it is not coincidence that the massive outbreak of very long, very bloody, very confusing um, religious wars uh, in Europe uh, in the 16th century coincided with the advent of, of printing uh, and people just pouring out, and literacy, and people just pouring out these, these mad pamphlets uh, and chat books uh, constantly. Uh, I mean, disinformation during the English Civil War, that, that was what it was all about. Um, so I think there is a certain amount of, um, of getting used to, to the way things work and people being bitten and being burned um, and maybe in, in a very small way, this is starting to happen in Britain now when people say, well, actually, you know, this Brexit thing, it's, it wasn't like that at all. And yeah, some people it will make cynical, just, and that's it. But other people will think, well, you know, maybe I can uh, have a, a different attitude towards the information uh, that I'm getting. So, um, but that, that may, I'm afraid, take, take, take a long time. Um, and, and in the meantime, as I say, we just have to be uh, to be conscientious and and truthful, um, and try not to waste too much time explaining things to people who aren't interested in 
in explanations and who say they want to discuss something but actually simply want to wait until you finish talking before they um, blast their, their bullshit in your in your face. Um, so uh, I, I, I think the other problem is there's a lot of um, information deserts. Uh, and I suppose the most optimistic thought that I can conclude with, um, and, and maybe this is crazy, uh, but I still think that there's something in this uh, hunger for disinformation that is still a hunger for information. Mm. Uh, and that's not a bad thing. Uh, and if uh, people uh, can uh, learn to, to distinguish by themselves and, and get better and more information, um, then I, I, I just think that with, with, with Brexit, um, there was this great divide between um, the, the educated and the I mean, uh, the not so um, not so degreed up part of the population. Uh, and, and there's a part of me that thinks, yes, these are people who, who really want to know what's going on. Um, and they've now tried the, uh, the sort of the, the, the tempting uh, fare in the, uh, the, the fat rich, sugar rich lies. Um, and, and perhaps next time, uh, they they will uh, reject information obesity in favour of something a little more healthy. Thank you. Uh, Anna, do you have any uh, recipes how to find this information? I'm, I'm, going to, um, I'm going to put in a shout for the information age. Um, the Holodomor was completely covered up um, by the Soviet regime at the time and literally didn't come out, and, and by Western journalists, yeah. you know, we... The Durante case, we all know about that. Um, and that was possible to do in those days, and it literally didn't come out till the 80s, till the Glasnost in the Soviet Union and Robert Conquest's great book, Harvest of Sorrow, based on interviews and, um, with survivors, with emigres um, and memoirs. And that also was the early 80s, I think. Um, you know, contrast that with today, where people are posting video they've taken on their mobiles of trains going west, um, you know, carrying dozens and dozens of tanks um, to the borders of Ukraine. You know, that's now impossible for Russia to cover up. Um, and I think that is an extremely good thing. Thank you. Nolan, please. I, I think it's important to note that Russia hasn't invented anything new here, right? I mean, it was the ancient Greek writer Aeschylus who said, was coined with the phrase, in, tru in war, truth is the first casualty. You know, armies have used disinformation deception for thousands of years to achieve their military objectives. What's changed now, I believe, is the tools available to Russia and other malign actors, China, Iran, you name it. You know, it used to be even a, a generation ago, there was a buffer between countries and populations. There is this filter of the news, the journalists, the media industry that could to some degree, at least sort out lies from the truth and try to transmit those things to their populations. But now Russia effectively has a direct vein into the brains of our citizens. And so in, in essence, you know, war is not just about territory anymore, physical territory. It's also about the sovereignty of our brains to not be corrupted by these malign actors around the world. And I think it's really interesting to note, like in the last 24 hours, right? There's the news that Russia is pulling its forces back from Ukraine's borders. They show a few videos, which, by the way, have already been proven to be lies. They've already proven that the tanks are actually driving toward Ukraine's borders. <laughs> <laughs> right? But, I mean, the Twitter universe just went ballistic. Everybody's, oh, it's over, it's over, it's all a lie. Biden was lying to us the whole time. All this stuff happened. And then it turns out that more troops are coming. And then it, it explodes. And just everybody and just like, get whiplash trying to figure out what's going on. And that's the point, right? Russia isn't trying to convince us of a lie. They're trying to cloud the information space with so much disinformation that we don't know where the truth is. And to the point now where many people start, they stop believing there is a truth. They don't even believe that there is an, an, a definitive like truth in this world is a post-truth era, right? We always hear about that. And that's the problem. That's what Russia does is they 
pump out all this dense information. They cloud the information, information space that we now, most media consumers, have lost faith that there is an objective truth out there. And so from my point of view, the best way to fight this propaganda, the best way to combat it is not necessarily to be like, this is a lie, this is a lie, don't read RT, don't read Sputnik, blah, blah, blah. No, we have to present news and information to people that they trust. We have to reestablish trust with the media consuming audience and to reestablish their faith that there is a, a good actor out there who is telling them the truth, is trying to tell them an objective reality because people do not believe in that right now. And from my own country, I have to say, whether you know rightly or wrongly deserved, when President Trump was in office, a lot of journalism ethics rules went out the window because people saw Trump as a threat to our democracy. Now, I'm not going to say he was or was not. That's not my place. However, I don't think we should throw out journalism rules about anonymous sources and all that just because we don't like the guy in office. We need to hold ourselves to higher ethics because... Now, when they're on the cusp of World War III, potentially, people don't believe us anymore. And so we need to fight disinformation by fighting for the truth or fighting for people to believe us. And when, I, when I'm out there in the front lines risking my life to tell people the truth, it pisses me off when people say I'm lying because I'm not. I'm there. And I want people to believe me. But it's hard in this day and age to have that belief. And so I think that as journalists collectively, we have to hold, our, hold ourselves to the highest possible standards at all times, no matter what subject we're writing about, to, to reestablish that faith in our profession and our faith in our desire to be objective arbiters of the truth. Thank you so much. James, James and Nolan, you cannot see, but we're facing a room full of people here, about 100 uh, 100 people came to, to hear you all speak. Um, it's a pity you can't see them. They can see you, so I'm really, um, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm really dying to open the floor to the discussion. Now, please uh, introduce yourself so you feel comfortable with doing so. Um, we've got a mic. We are recording this discussion. It will be on our YouTube channel. Um, so, yeah, just wait for the mic. Raise your hand, please, and I'll pass the mic to you. So, lady over there, and then followed by a gentleman over there. Maybe let's We'll collect a couple of questions and then answer them in clusters. Um, hello, my name is Katarina Thiersen. I was in Ukraine for the first time during Maidan in 2014. And um, it resulted in some articles for a working class uh, newspaper called Militant. And I feel after the discussion, I want to be a voice of the working class. <laughs> in Ukraine and in the UK, and probably other countries too. First, I think, um, there was, um, Nolan made a, um, you know, you, 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 you equal what would happen in Ukraine to what happened in Desert Storm. I don't think that that's a good parallel, because Desert Storm, Saddam Hussein sent all the officers and all the planes away to save them, and the, the Soldiers in the trenches were left without any sort of organization to meet the invasion. So they did the right thing, they gave up. I don't think that's the case. After having been at Maidan, I don't think that's the case in Ukraine, where you can see you know, how this was organized. Not, it was organized, but it was a lot of initiative by people who just wanted to do something, and it defeated, you know, like somebody, you know, others know better than me the kind of, of violence that was defeated. So I don't want to um, minimize at all the, the Russian threat, and the, but I don't think it's a good parallel. And okay, okay. I'll, I'll take like, that. Like, I think you misunderstood what I said. Okay. <laughs> I was not <laughs> implying at all the, the Ukrainian side of the conflict. I think I want to make very clear that the type of war that Russia is about to wage is going to involve military elements comparable to what the United States used against Iraq in Desert Storm. And I want to make very clear that we're not looking at another little green men scenario or something. This is going to be a combined arms campaign with airstrikes, rocket attacks, GPS interference. I mean, the whole whole nine yards are going to be used against Ukraine. I, I you know, I was not implying in any way 
And I did not say so that the Ukrainian military was going to react like the Iraqi military. There's night and day differences. The Ukrainians are going to fight. There's no doubt about that. I can tell you after eight years in the trenches, they're going to fight. And once the Ukrainian, if the Ukrainian military, God forbid, is defeated, the Ukrainian people, I have no doubt, are going to fight for their freedom. There's no doubt about that. There's absolutely no comparison whatsoever. Okay. I, spent, I spent my youth in Iraq and Afghanistan. I can tell you, we tried to convince those countries that democracy is a good idea. Ukrainians don't need to be convinced about democracy is a good idea. Like you said, on the Maidan, they braved sniper fire for the sake of their freedom. And for the last eight years, they've been fighting in the trenches in the Donbass to keep those dreams alive. And in civil society, to get rid of corruption, to put their democracy in the right path. It's a top to bottom, top to bottom grassroots effort to fix this country and to put it on the right path, on a pro Western trajectory, all that. So, yeah, my comment was obviously um, intended just to imply the seriousness of the military threat that Russia poses to Ukraine right now. We're talking about a combined air campaign with missile attacks, electronic warfare, and armored columns potentially to encircle Kiev. That's and thanks for the clarification. Thank you. And the answers of the time, do you have okay. a question? Yeah. Yes. No, I also want to point to this thing, you know, to sort of speak in the name for, for, for working class people in Ukraine and here, because we're all facing a crisis, although it can't be comparable, you know, it's different. But the kind of distrust in politicians, you hear it here too, if you knock on doors and talk to working people. And I believe, you know, the question was, what can we do? I really believe in working class solidarity, especially as workers here are beginning to win some strides, like flower shoes and B and Q in the workshop. I think that's what we're looking. You know, what we do if, if working classes seems like a narrow thing. Think about you know people to people solidarity. I do not believe in the UK and US and German and French governments. They are. They don't agree. They are defending their own interests, but I, it doesn't make me pessimistic. Thank you, and I think uh, Paul will have something to say about that in a minute. But let's let's take another question. But please keep your questions brief. I really want to collect as many as possible. We're collecting questions. Um, Alan Flowers, Kingston University, I'm also chairperson, Anglo Belarusian Society, and I'm engaged in academic, cultural, and democracy development activity in both Belarus and Ukraine for about the last 30 years. Yeah, democracy development in Belarus, how about that for a lifelong work? <laughs> um, I just want to briefly give you two sentences from an engineering colleague of mine sitting in Lviv sent to me tonight and then lead to my question which follows directly from the way my Ukrainian colleagues and I'm looking at a room full of people who I'm not the only one who hour by hour, day by day recently, is in direct contact with our families and our friends in Ukraine. And the theme of my question is, don't we all feel there's a very different mood amongst the Ukrainian people in Ukraine at the moment, what they're seeing, what they're hearing on the media, and, and what we're getting here in London? Um, the, 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 the contrast, I'm saying, look, I've just seen something on Sky, BBC, Channel 4, whatever, and they're saying, what? We're not seeing that. So here, here's a statement from Levy. This is a 39-year-old academic, fluent English speaker who's engaged with media, sitting today in Lviv. Quote, in general, it's all quite strange situation looks like fake and not real at all. So many visits with both Zelensky and Putin as well, and to finish, seems nothing is going to happen. But everyone is trying to prevent this nothing. It's a mess. <laughs> Please, to our journalists in Kiev, the question, what actually is the media message, the mood? What really are you hearing today, last few days, in Kiev that seems apparently to be so different? What is the contrast? And that, I can't believe this is a conspiracy, because as long as we've got journalists like Paul there, there's no way he's going to be told what to write. But we do seem, I feel, we're getting a somewhat different message and the hype when I'm staying up till one in the morning and then wondering if there's going to be 
I passed a news story at six because I'm hyped up and worried here. And my friend in Ukraine is going to bed early, not worrying. Something's different. Could we hear what the difference is? I think your friends in Ukraine are also worried, but it's true, the messages are quite different. And one more question here, just while we've got the mic, Alan, just maybe pass it on to the front row. Uh, Chris, 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 yeah, just there. And, and then we'll, we'll uh, answer them. Um, hello, it's uh, Chris Ford from the organizer of the Ukraine Solidarity Campaign and I've been supporting tr free trade unions in Ukraine since 1984. Uh, I wanted to ask a question about the West and Ukraine. Uh, firstly, what do you think the compromises are that the Western governments, and particularly Biden, was attempted to get from Zelensky and Putin? And particularly a point towards Minsk and the, the situation of the DNR and LNR. And how significant is the decisions of the Duma in Russia with regard to integrating those republics in, the, in this current situation? The next question I want to ask is about the situation here. Uh, you may have noticed that several days before the announced day of national unity in Ukraine, all the oligarchs left Ukraine in their private planes, uh, along with a number of members of the Rada, which was hardly a show of unity. Some came back. But some came back, that's a pity. Uh, the, uh, which points to my question of here. There is a huge problem in this country with the influence of Russian oligarchs and Russian money and donations to the Conservative Party. We had an investigation by Parliament which has been left dusted, gathering dust into Russian influence, particularly in the Brexit referendum. How influential is this and what sanctions could be put? I know the question was asked about the Labour Party. John McDonnell, the previous Shadow Chancellor, put forward a very robust programme to address the Russian money. Now that's disappeared. But this seems a key question because sanctions are pointless if that's not addressed. Thank you, Chris. So we'll take them in order. So first about the solidarity of the working class, Paul, would you like to comment? Well, I mean, what 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 is happening? Some British trade unions have, so for example, the picket that we did outside our team uh, three weeks ago. Uh, we, sadly, so far, even though we've got a whole swathe of you know, from the sort of right to the left of the British Labour movement, who technically do support the position that I would support, which is massive sanctions, which is um, unity or you know, maintaining unity of both the European Union and NATO against what Russia is doing, but clearly saying that this is an aggression, a criminal aggression. Despite all that, the biggest problem is that the MPs don't want to talk about it because it's 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 like off topic. You know, it's, a, it's off topic even for, for political people, for their constituents who are worried about the cost of living, cost you know, uh, uh, inflation, uh, where they're going to get their next job. It's just off topic. That's the big problem we have. But there is, you know, you know there, there are, we, we will be going later this week on a solidarity visit where there will be two British trade union leaders who will go and talk to, and one senior figure in the, in the Welsh Labour Party will go and talk to, uh, to, to their counterparts in, in Kiev. Um, what can we do, what can we do to, to move on from that, which is not a brilliant position, let's, let's face it. I mean, I think we, we do have to, to, to see transnational solidarity as not simply between peoples, but between classes and subsections of civil society. Um, I think what, one of the things I've been involved in, uh, alongside the LSE academic, Mary Caldor, um, was the convening of a cross-border, just a conversation between Ukrainian civil rights and human rights defenders and Russian human rights defenders um, and other human rights uh, people. One of, the, one of the things that came out of that was a call, which I think we've, we've got some echo for in other parts of European civil society, for the ultimate end point to this, to be civil society, whether it's workers, middle-class people, whatever, citizens, Having their voice inserted into this circus of, you know, Zelensky, you know, sort of, you know, the, the kind of circus of diplomatic visits with our own agenda. And our own, I, many of us believe that the only way of advancing a civil society agenda when, you know, the sides are tooled up to the nines um, is to talk about a second Helsinki process, a process where we take economic justice, human rights, and you know, the, the settlement of geopolitical conflict as a whole 
Um, it's not surprising, actually, that that's come from the academic and human rights and left sector, because that's something that I think is missing at the moment from the dialogue of state on state. They're just not even there. They can't, for the reasons I started out by saying, they're not even at a stage where two of the three major players in the world even believe a rules-based system exists. But if we in civil society believe it exists and must be made to exist, then raising a civil society agenda for how this ends, because all conflicts end, um, must be something that we take ownership of. Thank you. Now, perhaps I can ask uh, directly the second question to you about the difference in reporting. Um, and especially, we saw this over th this last weekend. I noticed that a lot of my uh, colleagues, journalists based in Kyiv, uh, were not very pleased with, with the reporting coming out of uh, the West, I mean, in particular, the US. Uh, based journalists, you know, about the imminent attack. It's definitely going to, ha to happen this weekend, this date of 16th of February being, you know, floating around and so on, and saying, look, calm down, it's not fun for us to read these tweets, these articles, while we're here on the ground trying to, you know, trying to somehow continue our lives. Maybe you could comment a little bit about the, the difference in, in, um, in the way that the media in Ukraine and the media outside of Ukraine approach this. Especially the last few days, I suppose. Is that to me? I'm sorry. Yes, please. Yes, if, if that's all right. I mean, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so, I'll say, like, one thing is when Western journalists come to Ukraine and they ask people their opinion, they typically are asking, you know, some high-ranking government official who wants to downplay the threat for keeping the population calm, you know, not d destroying the economy by causing panic, all that. Or they're going out to some market and interviewing a pensioner who... You know, might might you know listen to a radio broadcast or something, but is not necessarily like got their thumb on the pulse of the news. And with respect to the question about you know the middle age or the you know the thirty nine year old man in Lviv, I, mean, I gotta say my experience has been totally different here in, in Kiev. But people are taking it seriously now. Of course, not run around you know screaming into the wind like you might expect. You know, if this happened in America, people would be flipping out because we want to show our emotions and everybody wants to you know be the star of the show. But in Ukraine, people, it's a totally different culture. They don't show their emotions on their sleeves. Moreover, this is a country that's been at war for eight years. So they don't, you know, they're not acting outwardly panicked, but that doesn't mean they're not concerned. If you talk to somebody for more than a couple of minutes, you learn that it's not apathy you're seeing, it's grace under pressure, right? They're dealing with this in an extraordinary way. And I think in a hundred years, people would write, write about this moment and say, my God, like the same way the British people reacted during the Blitz. People here are showing immense and incredible resolve in a very difficult situation, but that does not mean they're not taking it seriously. And so you know, here in Kiev, the last few months, I've been out to multiple military, military training sessions for civilians, hundreds of people coming out to learn how to defend their streets against a Russian invasion. You see civil society offering courses in combat first aid, how to pack go bags, how to find the nearest bomb shelter, how to take care of your kids in a combat environment. All civil society volunteer initiatives separated from the government. The Ukrainian people is an incredible moment as a you know for democracies around the world to witness the society in which people are not waiting for the government to come in and save them. It's quite remarkable. But I have to say, I I, I would say that, that that comment from your friend is completely not indicative of the of the of the uh, the mood here in Ukraine. That people do take the threat seriously. However, they're not panicking. They're not flipping out about it. Again, they've lived with this threat for eight years. It's more serious now. I know countless people I've interviewed who have plans to evacuate Kyiv, who are buying supplies, who've already got their families from the men who want to fight, have already sent their wives and children out of the city to prepare for what may happen. So yes, people are taking it seriously. Um, I think that, you know, good on the United States and the UK and other NATO allies for if we have intelligence that a, an attack is imminent, you know, maybe we're going to take some hits or Zelensky's going to laugh at us in the, in the short term. But you know what? If it saves lives, maybe it's very possible that uh, President Putin planned to attack today. But we called him on it and he lost the element of surprise. We might have averted attack today because we learned our lesson from 2014 and we're being extraordinarily straightforward and upfront with what we know when we know to call Russia at every single move, every step along the way. And that may, you know, when the history books are written about this, you know, in 50 years or whatever, we learn what the CIA and all the NSA has been doing. 
it might be a pretty extraordinary story of intelligence success, finally, uh, to avert a war. Thank you. So we had two more complicated questions. One about the motion from the Russian Duma to the Russian president asking to recognize the so-called DNRL and uh, um, as uh, independent republics, uh, which he is quite clearly reluctant to do, because that is shooting himself in the foot, I think. Um, but perhaps one of you could comment on that, why this, why this part of performance developed. Uh, in the Russian Duma, and the second question from Chris was about uh, something we touched upon very briefly about uh, Russian wealth here and what is being done or rather not being done about it. Who would like to take those? So I, I, both of those, one of those. Oh, very well. Anna, please. Um, on the DNR and the LNR, I don't know why the um, Duma has put forward this motion asking Putin to recognise them because it's plainly um, much more strongly in Russia's interest to keep them, you know, to force uh, the, the, the implementation of Minsk too, so that they can they stay within Ukraine, but as Trojan horses, as vehicles whereby Moscow can control Kiev. And if you, there's a very interesting interview, a panel discussion that was on a couple of weeks ago, the Henry Jackson Society did it, and you can still find it via their website. Uh, Krem, uh, 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 a um, Russian think tanker called Suslov, Oleg Suslov, was one of the speakers, and he, uh, he, 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 he used the word Trojan horse several times approvingly, saying, yes, this is our tactic, and this is how it's going to work, isn't that, you know, <laughs> isn't it going to be effective, isn't that great? Um, so I, I would, I, if you're interested in the sort of question of Minsk and whether or not it should, you know, it could be a diplomatic way out of this, uh, have a listen to that first. Um, on the money, on the Russian money in London, um, it's been incredibly disappointing so far. You know, the Magnitsky Act hasn't really made any difference. There have been, I think, a grand total of four unexplained wealth orders so, so far. And none of them applying to Russians. I remember the first was in Uzbek, I think, who had fallen out with um, her government. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's going to take a lot of disentangling because particularly the legal industry, um, the banking industry, the property um, property developers and estate agents you know, are making a quite a bit of money out of Russia. It's not, it's not the bulk of their business. Um, you know, I've had banker friends say it's the cherry on the cake, Russian, Russian business. You know, it's, a, it's an extra, it's not the core business, but it's still nice to have. Um, so it will require a government to face down, um, you know, powerful interest groups to actually do something about that. And I fear that uh, we might have to wait for a Labour government for that. Thank you. James, any comments on, on any of those? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, I, I think as far as the oligarchs flying out of Ukraine is concerned, I think the problem is not them flying out of Ukraine, the problem is them flying back. Um, <laughs> But um, no, I, I mean, things do look bleak. I, I think Anna's absolutely right. It probably um, will wait for, have to wait for a, a Labour government. The, um, I mean, this government is not going to take serious um, steps um, unless, and, and perhaps even with um, a, um, a, a massive Russian assault on, on Ukraine. Um, but this is, I mean, it's just the Russian situation is just one part of the the much broader way in which uh, the city of London has been captured by uh, by, by the offshore um, finance industry, by the money laundering industry, uh, essentially. And um, there is not either the will or on the political level. I mean, lots of people have written uh, very, very brilliantly about this, particularly um, Oliver Oliver Bullock. But um, there isn't either the will or the kind of the the intellectual apprehension of the of the scale of the problem and the steps that need to be taken to to um, to overcome it. I mean, look at Joseph Jacob Rees Mogg, um, his business for many many years, um, and he's still a sort of a, a sleeping partner in the business. Was taking um, wealthy people's money, um, some from Britain, some from other places. Uh, and investing it in Russia, investing it in China, investing it in um, in Korea, um, because um, he, there wasn't enough money to be made by investing it in Britain. Um, and 
he part of his business is um, as part of his business, they, they set up a, an offshore um, system uh, in the Caribbean, not to hide his own money, but so people who were already offshore um, could take their offshore money, passage it through his, his organization for investment purposes, and then take it out again without ever touching onshore. So when you have a man like that at the very, very heart of government, um, whose very business model is, is predicated on complete frictionless movement of capital around the world, um, I mean, they're, they're already there. Never mind clamping down on the oligarchs. What about clamping down on the, on the, um, the investment managers in, in the very, very heart of government? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a kind of secret coup, really, that's, that's already happened. And, and the, the measures that will need to be taken to, to eradicate it go very deep. Having said that, if there is this, um, this massive invasion that, uh, that Nolan fears, um, and many others, uh, then yeah, it would be it would be a kick. I, I don't think the Russian state apparatus is nearly as vulnerable to sanctions um, as people seem to think. And in fact, I think almost the opposite. It, it may well make them stronger um, for Putin and the uh, the Siloviki, the, uh, the the strong men around him. Um, they derive all their sense of of wealth and power. Um, and prestige inside the country. They know that anything they need, they can get um, from China, and um, if, if not from Russia itself. Uh, and this idea that Russia is going to somehow melt because um, a few um, wealthy Russians or powerful Russians can't um, easily get to their villas in the south of France um, is, is a little bit of a, a red herring, besides which, we do tend to forget the number of financial hostages that Russia has of ours. Mm. Uh, and I think one of the first casualties of a, uh, of a, a serious freezing of assets style sanctions program against Russia by Britain would be the confiscation of British Petroleum's very large stake in, uh, in Rosneft. It's like, thanks very much. We'll take that 15 billion or 50 billion, however much it is, uh, and you'll never see it again. Um, so uh, it, it's it's not going to save Ukraine. Oh dear, <laughs> James. Thank you. Uh, we're really desperately out of time, but we did start a little late, and um, we can stay here and have a little reception after and speak informally. But I'm really keen to make the best use of our Kiev-based uh, colleagues. So let me take um, another one or maybe two very very brief questions. So I noticed two immediately, lady over there and one at the back, and those will be our last. Mm. Okay, Ola, make it brief. Three questions, oh, super brief, please. Okay, let's begin with you. Uh, Marianne Delargi, uh, the student of King's College uh, of London. And uh, I would like to add to the second question, and probably the answer is that Ukraine actually they are leading uh, in the stage of warfare from 2014. And also, uh, what we see now, Ukraine, they are stronger. So that's not Ukraine that we saw in 2014. So they are ready to fight and they are not leaving actually the country. And regarding the uh, third question, uh, the Duma resolution, so that's actually probably it could be a part of um, cognitive warfare of Russia because it's not the first time uh, when they try uh, to adopt that re resolution in Duma and that was, that's probably the second time. And they, they look at the probably at the Western reaction. Um, and my question uh, is next. So is it just the issue between Ukraine and Russia? Or is it the issue between two systems, democratic system and authoritarian regimes? Because uh, even if we look at the map, we see what we see, Ukraine. No, so no, the geographical position <laughs> Okay. Yes. We're, we're yes. just really running out of time. Yeah, Your question sorry. is very clear and very yeah. valid indeed. So, lady over there, had a hand up. Hi, my name is Irene. I'm uh, from Ukraine and um, I was born in East Ukraine. My question is twofold, but I'll try to be as much brief as I can. So, um, first of all, I think um, it, Russia is being perceived as, um, well, 
uh, actually people that have completely different mentality and way of thinking and completely um, in here uh, in, in the West world is being um, underestimated and so I think every time a Russian president or somebody from uh, their fault speak um, is being perceived as, as, as face value so if they say they leave Ukraine it's perceived as they leave Ukraine if they say they are not in Ukraine they perceive as they are in Ukraine and so I think don't you think it's better to be uh, to check this information um, and to have this adjustments to their mentality and their trickery whenever they express themselves because even when I well it's, it's been explained the relationship between Ukraine and Russia as if they were exes uh, but that would be presuming there was a love relationship beforehand and it was never so for instance my grandma was a victim of this genocide that's been discussed a lot more and um, it was not so long ago, but um, even during World War II, um, uh, let's not forget that one third of the World War II, they've been fighting on Nazi side. And the concentration camps that Nazis created, the idea was taken from the concentration camps that Russia created. And they st started practicing them on Ukrainians and other nations. Uh, the way they were fought over the new territories, they had these ethnical cleansers that uh, they used to call them. So they did the same as with Tatars back before, but with Ukrainians in, in, most in, 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 in a greater amount. So more than 10 million Ukrainians were killed. But um, so, and about this, uh, the, the second thought of my question was that, um, do you agree that it's better to, um, it would be best if, um, Everything that's being said in Russia news would be at least reported in the, in the West because, um, well, I, I haven't seen changes in the rhetoric um, since those days. Uh, like, well, well um, because they keep expressing the ideas uh, that they want to conquer the whole Europe. Can up to up to Lisbon, right. and so they they think even Poland is part of their country, and it, everything is belong to them. Okay, thank you, thanks very much. And one last question, please. Thank you very much. My name is Olga Malczewska. I'm a journalist. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank to the honourable speakers for your deep understanding of the agenda and the background which takes the discussion to a totally different level compared to 2014, in my experience. Um, I have two very big questions. Well, first is, from my family and my friends in Ukraine and the journalists who work there for the, for the different funding kind of media, there is a sad expectation that it will not be a question of will he wait or won't, but it will be a question of how long will that hybrid war be taken after the Winter Olympics is over and all the Western media are tired of the Ukrainian question and are back to their countries. So, in your understanding and in your expectations, um, how long can you be there <laughs> and how long can it actually... Will it Will the West be able to prevent that hybrid war from escalating when everybody is back? And the second question is, I will say special thanks to you, who, who is in Kiev now, and who expressed the understanding that this war is actually being a Russian war in Ukraine. But as a Western journalist walking here, I am quite limited in what I can say, right? And we are we're using facts and we are calling it from, we've been calling it for many years. Um, Russian backed separatists right fighting in Ukraine. So what else in your opinion should happen for the Western media to have that switch from the Ukrainian crisis to the Russian war in Ukraine? Thank you very much. Thanks so much. Very important questions. I'll just very quickly reiterate reiterate. So the first one was about the war of systems. This is just you know, this is not just the war between countries, but actually between different systems, democratic and authoritarian. The second one uh, provocative question, should we expose ourselves even more to Russian media so we actually get to know what is being broadcast inside Russia? Believe me, whenever I do that, I regret after the first 60 seconds or so. And then the question from Ole at the end, two questions. 
how long will the journalists from the West stay in Ukraine? Will they be able to uh, help de-escalate uh, this hybrid warfare? And when will the language switch happen? Language is important, it's part of this hybrid warfare. Lots of questions. I'd really like to um, give our Kyiv-based uh, colleagues a chance to answer some of them. Um, and then final remarks from Anna and Paul. Um, Nolan, you look like you're ready to go. <laughs> yeah, 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 I'm ready. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's so, still late in Ukraine as well. I really appreciate <laughs> you being still with okay, us. I've, awake. <laughs> Thank you. I've been here for eight years. I'm ready to tell the story. So, um, like, you know, as far as Ukraine, I think one, one part of one question, too, is about, you know, is Ukraine stronger now? And I have to say Ukraine's military exponentially stronger. But, too, and this might be a weird thing to say, the war probably was one of the best things that ever happened for Ukraine's democratic society. In 2014 and 15, when the regular army was on its heels and was being basically, you know, you know, it was being overrun by the, the Russian unconventional invasion of the Donbass, um, it was the Ukrainian people, the volunteers, the volunteer battalions who went out there and reversed that Russian advance and fought the war to the stalemate that exists today. When the war settled into a stalemate, those volunteer soldiers went on and spearheaded the civil society movement the last, you know, seven and a half years since you know the war began when that and that has really supercharged ukraine's democratic progress so i think not only the military has become much stronger and more capable but ukrainian society the democracy that you know from the bottom up that the roots of this de this democracy have gotten much stronger in the last eight years and that makes this country a much more difficult uh, target for russia because you know if russia couldn't subvert this country in 2014, there's absolutely no way that's going to happen now. Um, to, to, the, to the issue of you know, language in the, in the East and all that, I mean, I got to say one thing, it's important to note, and I think this is the advantage of being a Ukraine-based journalist rather than a Moscow-based journalist who parachutes in here for a week or two at a time, is that you get to know the country and you get to know what language you should be using. Um, to the point about this being a, a, a language war, for example, the overwhelming majority of volunteer Ukrainian soldiers I've met over the past seven and a half, eight years of conflict have been Russian speakers from the eastern part of the country who saw their hometowns being overrun by Russian soldiers in 2014 and wanted to fight for their land, for their territory, for their families, their homes. So like the idea that this is somehow an east-west cleave or division within Ukraine is completely false. It's a Russian propaganda lie. And I can say for her, anecdotally at least, a many, the overwhelming majority of soldiers I've met are Russian speaking. Here in Kiev, by the way, most people, if you go to a restaurant, they're going to probably speak to you in Russian. It's, it's an incredibly patriotic country, but it, you know, the language thing is not the defining issue here. It's about people believing in Ukraine's sovereign right to exist as a free and democratic um, country. How long will people stay here? Um, well, I think, you know, the pressing military threat that Russia is exerting right now cannot last that long. You've got, you know, according to President Biden, you've got 150,000 Russian troops on the border right now. Um, a lot of them are living in tents. You know, a lot of them, some of them are coming from bases within 50 miles of North Korea. So they're far from home. I imagine they're on very tight social media restrictions. <laughs> uh, so you cannot maintain that personnel presence for very long and maintain that military pressure in Ukraine for an extended amount of time before you're going to start to have cracks in the human side of this buildup. So I think that, you know, this element, if this is all just hype, you know, some sort of mind game by, by the Kremlin, it can't last that long. Unfortunately, you know, knowing the way that journalists, you know, basically bailed on Ukraine in 2015 when the, when the war settled into a ceasefire, I have to say, I think that once the threat of an imminent invasion is no longer there, I think most Western journalists will probably leave and not pay attention to Ukraine until there is another major escalation. You know, if we can find a, a solution in the journalism industry to make money besides page views, then maybe <laughs> Ukraine will be an interesting story because it's an important story. But unfortunately, I think salacious political stories usually make more money than foreign affairs stories these days. So unfortunately, to keep Ukraine in the public eye is going to be tough uh, once that immediate threat of, uh, of a major invasion is gone. I mean, Reuters right now has a 24-hour camera on the Maidan, assuming that they're going to start seeing bombs dropping in Kyiv. It's, kind of grotesque in a way. Uh, but the, the media attention is, is extreme here. Uh, but I, I, I sadly think that that will probably uh, evaporate. 
Thank you, oh, James. Uh, thank you. That is a pessimistic, perhaps, but realistic uh, assessment of the situation, James. Yeah, um, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. There were so many questions, and I wasn't really keeping track. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, so I'm, kind of, I'm gonna. There was there were some great questions, and I'm going to give some answers now. And, and whether the answers <laughs> to the questions, are not, <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I, I just want to, to sort of make a point about this this hybrid war expression because um, it, it did come up, and and I think it's it's not nearly as as sort of settled um, a term as as journalists um, often like to present it. Uh, I mean, I have read um, uh, an analysis by um, a, a well-known um, writer about Russian security issues, Mark Galliotti, who, who suggests that it's, it's all been a bit of a misunderstanding. And this was something that um, the, the Russian chief of staff said, and it, it, it was just in his, um, in his uh, report. And, and he didn't mean to make a big thing of it. Now, uh, clearly, the nature um, of war um, is, is always changing. Um, and Russia has been able, in its conflicts on the on the edge of the of, um, of Russia, to leverage the fact that there are lots of Russians on the other side of the border, there are lots of people who identify with Russia in some way at some level, um, perhaps it's, it's linguistically, perhaps it's culturally, um, or, or perhaps their, their economic conditions are particularly ghastly on, on the other side of the border. So um, I think the particular interventions that Russia has staged um, in Ukraine, in Georgia, in, in Moldova, in all those many places, um, they, they have tended to be in places where they already had some way in um, through, through the media, through local proxies. Um, and it's made them look more powerful than perhaps they are on the kind of on the bigger world stage. Um, and, you know, I, how long is hybrid war going to go on? Well, it's, it's going to go on forever. It, 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 it's, um, it, it's not going to stop. And it, and it was it existed um, even before Putin came along. Uh, I mean, you could argue um, because, you know, I'm, I'm an old war horse here and I've, I've been writing about Ukraine since the 90s, um, you could argue that Ukraine itself has in, um, embarked on, on forms of hybrid warfare. I remember a very strange interview I did back in the, in the 90s with this uh, candidate, this nationalist candidate for the Crimean elections. Um, and he just sort of came from nowhere. Um, I talked to him. He didn't seem to have very much to say. And then he disappeared, um, having collected probably just enough votes to make sure that the, the, the more dangerous nationalist didn't get in. And, you know, it was only many years later that I realized how naive I'd been. And this was probably put up by the, the Ukrainian security services of the, of the early 90s to, to make sure that, that they kept um, tensions in Crimea um, down low. So, I mean, this is, this is a kind of regular part that's not going to go away. But I think my, this, my, my main point that I wanted to make is that uh, what is happening on the borders of Ukraine right now. This is not hybrid war. This is war war. Uh, and I do sometimes feel, whether it's in Britain or even in Ukraine itself, that people who, you know, thank goodness, they're, they're wise people. They don't read a lot about um, what modern weapons can actually do, what sort of range of forms of, of destruction, um, the whole uh, spectrum of modern warfare is capable of because you don't see it in action very often as nolan said you saw it in action um, in the gulf wars um, but russia has never actually used it and the the scale uh, of the destructive power at russia's disposal i'm not talking about nuclear weapons i'm talking about conventional weapons the rockets the missiles the sheer weight of artillery um, even before you get to tanks and and infantry it's just on a completely, it's got nothing to do with, it's just war. It's war like, um, like, like the Second World War, uh, and it would be horrible and ghastly. Um, and that um, is, is really why we are sitting here, why there is this, this concern, why there is this panic. Um, there would be hybrid war as part of that. There was hybrid war before, there'd be hybrid war after. Um, but that is the, is, is the point that, uh, that, that we're, we're frightened of now. Uh, and and I think 
it's that partly explains why there does seem to be this big difference in in what somebody sitting in Lviv might feel and um, and somebody sitting in 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 Britain or a journalist writing in Britain or, or an American think tanker they're, they're looking at these two different things um before we started I was talking to Nolan and he was talking about people in in his native Florida waiting for hurricanes um and and now you know People are used to the idea that when a hurricane is forecast, um, it's going to come. But that wasn't always the case. Um, and uh, sometimes in the past, people have been um, quite skeptical that the weather forecast is, is really serious and this massive hurricane is going to come and, and, and sweep. And of course, sometimes it doesn't come. And then people say, oh, it was just, it was just nonsense. Uh, but those forces are there. And uh, if they were unleashed, it would be... You know, you would forget about hybrid war for quite a long time. Thank you, James. Um, Anna, please. Uh, is it a battle of values? It's definitely a battle of values. I can't think of any conflict um, in recent memory where it's, which has so obviously pitted, pitted a good guy against a bad guy. Um, it seems extraordinarily clear cut. Um, from the self interested point of view, I think a uh, a, a real war war in Ukraine would be bound to spill over somehow or other into NATO countries. Um, Ukraine, Ukraine's got borders with several NATO countries and it's hard to imagine a large scale conflict which didn't spill over those borders in some way. Um, I, I hope very much that Nolan's wrong, that there's a diplomatic way through um, and that has looked a lot more likely in the last few days. Um, you know, there's been much more, Lavrov has come up with much more sensible language, even Putin as well at his uh, joint press conference with Scholz after that meeting. Um, and obviously there's pressure being put on Zelensky to make sort of concessions on the Donbass and, you know, I think probably they're groping towards a form of words on NATO which doesn't uh, which doesn't concede the principle that NATO remains an open door, but publicly reassures Russia that Ukraine is not about to join anytime soon. Um, I don't, you know, all those concessions um, are, are humiliating and unpleasant, um, but I think well, to be honest myself, I think well worth, a price well worth paying to avert war. Thank you, Paul. Yeah, I would agree with that. Um, I, I would just add, it, it, it's not a battle of values, it's because my values and Boris Johnson's values are very different. Uh, but it's a battle of systems in the sense that it's not, we didn't, we didn't start it. it. You know, I go back to my original point, Putin and Xi Jinping announced that there is no division in the world between people who want a rules-based system and those who don't. And the things I care about, human rights, trade unions, um, the left, climate change, can only be addressed in a democratic system, and not just that, in a system that is the product of the single modernity that we have, which is the Enlightenment, which is the Renaissance, the Enlightenment, with all their problems, and all their white male slave owning uh, difficulties, have defined the modern world, and so did the outcome of World War II, which the Soviet Union bought into, a world system based on rules, we, want, we, need to check, we need to defend that so that each of us with our separate views of what kind of country we want to live in can argue about peacefully and democratically. That's the first thing. The second thing is about the sanctions. Yes, I fear that the West, sanction, the West will not fight for Ukraine. Very simple, NATO will not lift a finger if Putin invades Ukraine. Uh, they won't. But they can be persuaded to and engage in sanctions that I think have to be match the rhetoric of devastating and existential. Um, that won't be easy because, as everybody said, there will be blowback to us, to our lifestyles, more problematically in Central Europe than here, but, but there will be blowback. Um, however, I think the way to get one's mind around what we have to do is to stop thinking, for example, of the sanctions as a financial regulation issue and start addressing the problem that the West doesn't have a counter-hybrid strategy. Once you ask the question, what does a democracy do when attacked in a hybrid way, you're asking the question that nobody, I think, has really asked, uh, addressed for a long time. And it, it begs the question, who 
who owns the counter-hybrid strategy. That is, whether or not Russia invades Ukraine, there will still be hybrid uh, aggression against U UK democracy. Who owns the question of should the public affairs consultancies dotted along the strand um, be now targeted by the government to force them to divest themselves of, of Russian oligarchic money? Likewise, the, the, the property people, likewise the banks, likewise the commercial lawyers. Um, the financial regulator can't own that question, but you know we're, we're, we know the Ministry for Leveling Up in Britain. What, I think many democracies are going to have to end up with a Ministry for Counter Hybrid that owns the problem, that says to the police, look, have you noticed a pattern of people zipping around on little motorbikes between post offices and private addresses that might be containing millions of pounds? Um, this is, I report myself on a story exactly about that years ago. Um, well, in that case, what are you going to do about it? The, beyond the sanctions, people have asked about Labour. I will finish by saying something about Labour. I think the Labour will be tougher on Russian oligarchs. However, without naming names, there are some pretty senior Labour figures who've been up to their necks in Russian oligarchic influence, and therefore we will have to maintain pressure against that. Um, I think it's, Labour has also been admirable, not only in supporting the government on, on its firm line, to, you know, alongside Biden, with you know, with its NATO allies, but it's been incredibly and interestingly, for those of you who are nerdy about politics, supportive of Britain's bilateral measures towards uh, Ukraine. That is, um, they were equally supportive of the sending of the short-range anti-tank missiles as they were for pan-NATO solidarity movement, and th and that's been good. The final thing I'd say is this: I think we have to all in our heads have a contingency of what happens if Russia invades. I think we should go to a place and protest. Um, that place will not be the American embassy, which is where Putin's proxies uh, in, in, on the right and left will want us to go. It will be somewhere. Peacefully, we will demonstrate. But beyond that, here's the question. And here's the question that I think many politicians, Tory or Labour, do not want to answer yet. They don't even want to think about. If there is a long-term insurgency in Ukraine, against the Russian invasion, what do we do? Because the net, what will happen is that Donald J. Trump, will, any suggestion that President Biden would support that insurgency will become the issue of the 2024 um, presidential election. Trump will say, just as he said, get out of Afghanistan, he will say, stop supporting the terrorist Ukrainian nationalist Azov battalion and the rest of it. Uh, and, and that will become the, the issue of American politics. And so, to finish, I uh, will finish with a quote from a famous Ukrainian, although not one who many of you will like, um, Leon Trotsky, um, who did say, you know, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. And the Russian war against the Ukraine is interested in you in London, whether you're interested in it or not. What a quote to end on. We can Before I thank our speakers, I would like to just tell all of you that on the 29th of March, we will be hosting, um, together with our partners, Cambridge Ukrainian Studies, um, Association of Ukrainians in Great Britain, London Branch and British Ukrainian Aid, and the Frontline Club, um, an absolutely amazing speaker, Stanislav Aseyev, who was a native of Donetsk, uh, who reported for Radio Liberty Europe and other um, Western outlets from occupied Donetsk for a while until he was kidnapped and then held in the basement and finally in um, um, Isolatia, this absolutely horrendous concentration camp in uh, Donetsk for two and a half years. So he will be speaking here about his experience at the Frontline Club on the 29th of March. Please book your tickets. You can also join online. Um, it's, uh, it's on our website, it's on our social media pages, uh, do come. And all I have to do now with great pleasure is to thank our speakers, James Meek, uh, Nolan Peterson, Anna Reid and um, Paul Mason and all of you for coming here tonight. Please stay and have a drink and talk to us in Thank you.